Coming up on this week's show, a bizarre Mega Drive controller has been found. Best horror games to play for Halloween. And we chat adventure and RPGs with gaming historian Matt Barton. This week's show is brought to you by Harry's. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 248. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Actually, should it be a warm welcome on Halloween? Shouldn't it be like a chilly, spooky welcome on Halloween weekend? It's definitely a chilly, spooky week where I live. I've had the heating on all bloody week. (laughs) (laughs) Well, obviously, it is Halloween weekend when we're bringing this show out. And Halloween's going to be very different this year. You know, no Halloween parties. You won't be taking the kids out trick-or-treating. But a good excuse when the weather's cold to sit indoors and play some spooky video games. Now, it seems that every year on Halloween, we kind of do this. We go through some... uh, classic horror games that we're going to be playing but we have actually got a little article from uh, cbr.com that details some really good horror movie games that we'll talk about in just a bit and actually there's a couple of games that i've got picked out for the halloween weekend that i'm looking forward to playing as well so we are going to be getting all spooky on you in the retro Hell podcast in the next few minutes and of course we're going to be joined by a very special guest on this week's show as well now this week actually we're going to be joined by someone who was quite a big influence in the early days of us doing this show Yeah, so we're joined by Dr. Matt Barton. Now, you may know him from Matt Chat, which is a channel on YouTube. And if you haven't checked that channel, check it out because it was a massive influence on us. And, you know, Matt's wrote a lot of books. He's done some fantastic stuff linking Dungeons and Dragons to adventures and RPG and that whole kind of culture. So we've had so many guests on this show that have talked about how Dungeons and Dragons and the kind of initial ideas in role play and rpg were used and put into the gaming standards and matt has done some amazing interviews you know we've done some really good ones but matt's done ones that we haven't done like brian fargo of uh you know wastelands and Mm. he also does them with video as well and they go on for a long time so some of them are like two or three parters so i really recommend checking matt's channel out and listening to this interview and I love this chat that we had with him as well, because Ravi and I recorded this the other day. And really, I mean, you know, it, we, we didn't know what we're going into at first. We thought we we're going to talk about the people he's interviewed, or are we just going to get really geeky about, you know, RPGs and adventure games? It ended up being a bit more of the latter. So we were totally in our element, weren't we, talking to Matt, just chatting about, you know, so, I mean, we love adventure games anyway. I, I don't know what it is recently, but we seem to be on this, like, crazy adventure tip, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had Ken Williams on, Charles yeah. Cecilia, now we're talking about adventure games again. I think, you know, with this lockdown, maybe we we just want to get some adventure and kind of role play and play different roles in our lives, you know. A bit of escapism from 2020. Totally. <laughs> That's what this whole show's about, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, we're going to be joined by Matt Barton for a, a great geeky chat. If you're into your RPGs and adventure games, he'll be on the show in around 20 minutes from now. And also going to be catching up with a, a couple of old friends of the show as well, and Neil from RMC and uh, John from Amigos Podcast, because they've actually got a new podcast that we think you'll enjoy if you like our show. So we're going to get them on uh, to chat all about that in the next few minutes. Before we do, though, some good news stories to talk about this week now this uh this has actually been all over twitter i've seen this prototype sega genesis controller that actually looks a bit like some people are saying we nunchucks to me it kind of looks like looks a bit like a giant pair of airpods <laughs> you know what i was literally just thinking they look like airpods i was looking at this i've looked at it a couple of times and i was like These just look like headphones, these two giant headphones. (laughs) But yeah, this is really interesting. This has been posted on October 27th by a guy called Shane Bate or Bate Bate Bateu or something like that. Yeah. Um, Not too sure where he's got these images from, but yeah, it's a prototype Sega Genesis controller, which essentially is held together by a piece of plastic, but it splits splits apart into like two nunchucks, which is really interesting. The concept behind it was you'd have the D-pad in one hand and your A, B and C in the other hand but you could switch which way you want. So you could have the D-pad in your right hand if you were left-handed, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Which I think is so far ahead of its time because this would have been, what, like 88? This would have been kind of being looked at and played with and stuff like that, 1988, which is just so far ahead of the Wii. Um, Even though, you know, it's not actually anything to do with the Wii. There's no motion control in it or anything like that, which I thought what the article was going to say, that it's got motion control in there. But no, nothing like that. But what I think is actually more interesting, what it just touches on, is it's actually got a trigger button on the back. 
Yeah. Just like yeah. the N64 controller. I, which... I think it looks, if you see it, it looks quite like the PlayStation controller, actually. When it's oh, in it the plastic actually. case, you know, yeah. the, the, the long bottom ends yeah. of it. And uh, if you think at that time, Sega, it was really flat and kind of rounded, wasn't it, on the, on the Mega Drive? So, yeah, yeah. So no, it I'm... is really innovative in all, all kind of areas. Yeah, I, I, I feel that, actually. Now you've said it, I can see the original without the analog sticks. I can definitely see it. I wish they did, like, not necessarily, you know, change the Sega controller, the Mega Drive controller, but it would have been cool to, you know, to actually get this for it to have actually have come out. I mean, if you look at the tweet, original tweet by Shane Battier, I think his name is. Yeah. Um, he actually says the ergonomic handles on it are quite reminiscent of a Virtual Boy gamepad, which <laughs> I can see that as well. I mean, this does look a bit of a hybrid of yeah. lots of things that have come along in years later. Um, this didn't actually make it into retail production. But you, you, when you mentioned then, you know, the fact that if this was at the start of the Mega Drive's lifespan, that would have been late 80s. And mm. that was also the period when I think companies were getting a bit more experimental with yeah. controllers. Obviously, we had the, you know, the the infamous Power Glove came out yeah. around then, didn't it? So <laughs> I can understand maybe they were just kind of thinking, what's going to work? But I mean, you look at this, essentially, it's two lollipops that you hold in your hand. Mm. And you've got the, the action buttons on one side and the D-pad on the other. But I guess, like you said, the thinking was that if you're left-handed or right-handed, you can kind of swap it around to suit think- your style of play. Also, I like that it's like daisy chained on the bottom, like to yeah. the other controller, because I can imagine losing one of these, or you could get one of your mates and maybe with a game go right, you play the buttons, I'll do the direction. <laughs> and yeah. then you've got like a little two player experience. Yeah, interesting concept, but yeah. could also imagine, you know, when your grand's sitting and playing and she's moving from left and right, <laughs> and imagine you just totally going mad with these, like yeah, hitting definitely. everything. What I think is quite funny about them is because they're old school and the technology wasn't there, is that the the button one just has two wires coming out of it. One daisy chain to the other and then one to the mega track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing like internal or yeah. 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 Just, or, or just wireless. <laughs> I think having a, a Wemo, you know, even if you've got it kind of strapped to your wrist, that's still hazardous enough. My mother in law was actually playing Wii bowling at their place, and she, uh, my father in law's like, make sure you strap it to your arm. So I'll be fine. Threw it, smashed the TV screen. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, had to get a new telly. So these <laughs> things can be hazardous enough. I remember when that happened that because I remember your wife putting the claim in, <laughs> and, they had, and they made out the dog did it. And I was just like, I don't think it matters how it happens. <laughs> Oh, busted. <laughs> the, the dog's not very good at uh, Wii games. He's not good at Wii bowling. <laughs> you know what well, actually would be good, you know, if they put these like um these kind of handheld controllers together with do you remember the Sega Activator? Uh it was around back in the early nineties. Is that, that would one, just look mental? Is it? that the ring on the floor and you like yeah. punch and kick and stuff? Yeah, that would look crazy. That would have been a Wii like over a decade before the Wii was even thought of. <laughs> How to hang yourself with a controller, like trip up and then get one side. Yeah. Oh, dear. I must say these things do look, you know, like they'd be hideous to play like Streets of Rage or something with. But yeah, I do really want one. I think it would be fun just to... I think they look really with. light as well. Yeah. Like oh, maybe God, if yeah. you had a bit, a bit of weight in them, they might be interesting. Yeah, they look, but, they yeah. look like you'd, you'd definitely swing that around your head like a bloody ball and chain when you're fighting with your older <laughs> brother or something. <laughs> Now, of course, Cobra Kai has been something that everyone's been loving. I mean, I watched it when it was um, originally out last summer, but obviously um, that was when it was on YouTube. Mm. Now, Netflix have picked it up. This is uh, the continuation of the original Karate Kid. So good. And with the original actors in there as well. Everyone's loving it at the moment. And now there's actually a game that's available on the Switch, Cobra Kai, the Karate Kid Saga. Yeah, I've I loved Cobra Kai when it came to Netflix. I didn't watch it on YouTube, but my dad watched it on YouTube. And he was like, watch it, it's amazing, amazing, like a year ago. And usually my dad doesn't really get into those kind of things. But like, and I watched it on Netflix, absolutely loved it. Showed my wife this earlier on who loved it as well. And she's like, oh, oh, Cobra Kai game. And I was like, mm, it doesn't look like a AAA title, unfortunately, but it mm. still looks cool. Um, but it's, you know, it's coming out on the 24th of November on the Switch. And apparently it's coming out at the point of recording. It says it's out today on PS4 and Xbox One. And it is a physical release game as well, but essentially it, it's a bit of a Streets of Rage clone, just a bit of a side-along beat-em-up, but you can play either as the, you know, as Daniel, or you can play as, oh my God, what is his name? I know his real Johnny. name. Johnny. Johnny, there we go. I was like, his real name is William Zakba. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and you could play as either the Cobra Kai or the Miyagi, Miyagi Dojo. So there's two kind of story campaigns, which looks pretty cool. Um, 
but initial thoughts on the trailer definitely not a triple a game definitely yeah. not definitely not a 35 pound game at release in my looking opinion. at the characters they look like they're from sims 4 like yeah <laughs> the, the cut scenes for the fmv look really cartoony and stuff but yeah then the actual playing graphics it just looks like straight up sim sims 4 characters on a yeah. kind of cartoony landscape yeah they, they could have made them look a bit better i think or a I bit mean, more it, 80s yeah definitely and it's probably got a decent budget because of it's all the original voice cast it's you know it's um ralph macchio and all that they've all done the actual voices and apparently the writers and stuff who wrote the new cobra kai series have had inv- it just says they were involved in making the story for the game yeah that's what everyone cares about in these kind of side scrolling yeah. brawlers the story yeah that's very true yeah and so, i guess if it's got a banging 80s soundtrack and stuff, yeah maybe you know yeah definitely i mean the soundtrack mo- it was half original half kind of licensed songs in cobra kai but it worked really well so if they've done the same thing in this it could work really well but I'll be picking it up, but I'm going to pick it up when it's a tenner at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Banana Rama Cruel Summer better be in there. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it definitely looks worth a play. It, it, it reminds me weirdly of when they used to digitize fighting characters for like, um, you know, like Mortal the Kombat version and... of Mortal Kombat. Yeah. yeah. It, see, it just feels a bit rough. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like we want to, we want to be like, it's Cobra Kai. We love Cobra Kai. But I don't know what you mean. You kind of look at it as a gamer and just like mm, it looks a bit. You know when they the recreate when they recreate those news stories on like Japanese TV and it's always mm. really funny. Yeah, and it looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it now. You've said that. Yeah, it does to me look very similar to. It looks like they've been heavily influenced by Streets of Rage Four because you got mm-hmm. that kind of you know very yeah. cartoony comic book style graphics. Again, it's a side scrolling brawler very in the vein of streets of rage or double dragon um and it, you know even the style of it and the colors and everything looks very much like a not as good version of streets of rage 4 yeah 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 i think you've got it spot on there like if i guess if you enjoy streets of rage 4 and you want something a little bit more but you're just going to accept it's probably not going to be quite as good this is this is for you kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've got Christmas coming up when, like, your mum asks you, you know, what do you want for Christmas? And there, there's something just to say, because, you know, yeah. it is this time of year, like, oh, what do I need? Yeah, but definitely. I'd, I'd probably play it and enjoy it, I think, but yeah. Yeah, no, not I, I'm not, I'm not going to say I wouldn't enjoy it. I'd probably love it. I'd probably yeah. sit there loving it. But like I say, it's 35 quid. I could probably buy yeah. something different, you know, something, <laughs> <laughs> something a bit different. <laughs> Get it but down also, to a tenner. Joe's also, to yeah. a degree, like, Cobra Kai was a bit, it was like a bit indie, wasn't it? And it was a bit kind of developed. Yeah. So maybe this is like an indie kind of title where they haven't yeah. had as much budget as the other ones. But... Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah. sit there and rip it off and go, the graphics aren't as good as Tomb Raider or The Last of Us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Knowing full well, it's not. It's probably had a you know, 10% Small of that team, budget. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, a console that it might run on, uh, the new Atari VCS 2600. Uh, now, we did actually talk about this when it was rumoured back in the summer when we heard about the uh, the pricing that I think was leaked on a website and also the release date as well. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, this story. We originally talked about it when that little trailer was released all the way back in 2017. So it's been three years in the making. But they have now announced UK pricing £390 for the Atari VCS. The new console that looks... Very similar to the original 2600 Woody. Um, you've got a, a wireless controller um, that's available in one that looks a bit like an Xbox controller or one that mirrors the original Atari joystick. And it is going to be released next month in November, pretty much meaning that it's going to go head-on with the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. It looks better than the PlayStation 5 or <laughs> Xbox Series X, but I don't think it does more. Like That's probably just because of the retro appeal. But we've talked about this before, how kind of this console it's it's really hard to see the appeal of it like yeah. you know the main appealing thing for me is the box and i think if they sold that separately for about 150 or something that that they could make a bit of money but going against the ps5 and uh <laughs> yeah Xbox, i think <laughs> it's a really really kind of hopeful move on their Stupid. account you know optimistic the word, yeah. That's the word. <laughs> yeah. optimistic you've said it before ravi i think you said it last year when we were talking about it you're spot on there. They should just sell the shell. Just sell yeah. the shell. You for like for PC gamers and stuff for a hundred pound. You know, sell the controller. Sell you know, sell the controllers as wireless controllers that can connect for PC gaming and stuff like that, or work on the Switch or whatever. I just don't see three hundred and ninety quid. Like you say, for what ten pound more 
or even forty pound less, you can get the the lesser new Xbox, whatever it's called. Series Wait, look at no, it's three hundred ninety dollars in America, isn't the isn't the new Xbox the discless version two hundred ninety nine? So it's yeah. quite a lot less. It's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's more it's more expensive than the discless discless new Xbox. Yeah. I mean, it, it does look nice. <laughs> the the <laughs> expense the expense was that custom motherboard. Mm. That that custom motherboard where they got it printed with the Atari logo and Ryzen put on all of that and everything. But I'm sure you'd be able to kind of use the hardware of the other ones and and do this. I don't know if there's going to be emulators commercially, but on paper, the other ones are a hell of a lot more powerful. And, you know, again, it's not a product that's going to be going up against them because, you know, it's going to be a niche product. But yeah. with that kind of pricing, especially, I mean, normally if this had come out maybe a year ago, you know, when I think it was originally rumoured to, no one would have compared it to the next-gen consoles. But it's the fact that the PS5 and the Xbox X are going to get so much attention over the next few weeks. It does seem like, I mean, I've seen people on YouTube saying, are they actually planning this thing to fail? Because it seems like suicide bringing it out only a week or two after those well, I think they've priced themselves out of the mini market. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the problem, you know. The costs of making it has pushed them out of there. So maybe if they had a cheap FPGA board in there or, or, or something that would kind of reduce the cost. But at the moment, they're, out, they're like the high end of the mini market, aren't they? Well, that's the thing. So it's not like it's not a mini console that's just designed to play retro games. But also, on the same footing, it's not a state-of-the-art console that's going to play high-end new games. Or do ray tracing. or you know. Yeah, it's kind of lurking somewhere in the middle, isn't it? Which, I mean, you're kind of looking at, you know, like the Wii U did, really. You know, when that came out, that was just around the same time. I, I mean, admittedly, a bit before the PS4 and the Xbox One came out. Hmm. Uh, but again, everyone looked at that as like, you know, it's last year's technology because it can only run the same games as like the 360 and stuff. But this, I mean... I'm just struggling to see who's going to buy this. I'd be interested to hear from anyone that is going to buy the new Atari VCS. I mean, I'd probably pick one up if it was like £90, maybe. Yeah. That might be a bit more of an impulse, but just for the case and the, the controller. Well, it might be in a few years. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it might be by Christmas. You never know. Yeah, we're, we're putting the bargain bins next month. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's talk about another system. Now, this one um, really confused us. We were talking for about 20 minutes before we did the show, <laughs> trying to figure out what is going on here. Now, this is a system called Polycade. And actually, quite interestingly, following on from the Atari, uh, this is called the Polycade 2600. Can I Again, just name the polys? Because there's so yeah, many there's different poly polys systems. out Go there. On there. Name the poly. There's Polly oh, Pocket. <laughs> there's Polly Pocket. <laughs> <laughs> there's the Polycade. There's the Poly Mega. There's the Poly Station. And now there's the Polycade. We, I mean, Ravi seems to have a better grasp on this, but me and Dan were really struggling. So this is essentially an Indiegogo campaign that started this week, and it's come from Tyler Bushnell, who's the son of Nolan Bushnell, which is really interesting as well. But mm. it's weird because of like the actual thing is saying like, oh, it's a new console, which is the Polycade. He doesn't call it the Polymega then. The Polycade console, which essentially looks like an Atari 2600, but plays... Um, plays other games, <laughs> but just like the Atari Twenty Six Hundred that's coming out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what people seem to actually be backing is the arcade machines, which cost yeah. like thousands of thousands of dollars. So, so we were talking with Dan earlier, and he was saying, "I was going, oh, there's this Kickstart on Indiegogo, and and they've hit, you know, fifty one k as we're recording this show." And then Dan goes, "Oh, there was a previous one before." So, like. What's going on here? Like, how much did the previous one get? <laughs> well, they ran one looking on Kickstarter, which is where the original campaign ran back in 2017, and it was successfully back then. Uh, that got $125,000. And this was for the Polycade Retro Arcade of the Future, which looks like one of the products that they're actually running a campaign for on Indiegogo at the moment. Mm. So we were trying to get our head around. I mean, if this has already been a successful kickstarter and i mean it was only, only backed by 189 backers so they must you know put a fair bit of money up front to get over you know 125,000. Yeah. if these have already been delivered is this like a second one that they're doing somewhere else like and a more the, redefined version maybe well but well, then they've also got a bit of software the polycade kind of interface that you can install on your pc that also runs the same stuff by the looks of it so from what i can see you've got the polycade 2600 special edition which is the console version 
that's five hundred. Yeah, yeah, three hundred and eighty-four quid as well. So yeah. that's going against the Xbox and the PS One and got, the Atari VCS. Then you've got the Polycade Lite, which is an arcade machine for a thousand pounds. I do it in pounds. Then we've got the Polycade Lux, which is two thousand three hundred pounds. Then we've got the Squadcade, which is a four-player version, which is three thousand pounds. And then for six thousand pounds, you can get all of the above. Which and it seems to be, yeah, really niche as well because, like, the Polycade look, they've sold looks, they've sold 14 of them. I was going to say, it's like the majority the of the money. It's you know? the arcade machines that are selling at this point of recording. The actual game console, which is what I read was the actual launch product, has sold one on the Indiegogo. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't hold big hopes of getting lots of software ported to it then. No, I mean, apparently there's going to be 90 games on it, but essentially we've right. got like Bubble Bubble, um, Asteroids, a lot of indie games as well. Like, yeah, uh, a lot of indie games. And, yeah, yeah. You know so. what? Imagine if you back that and you were the only guy in the world with that console, <laughs> and there's like companies making games just for you. Yeah, can you imagine? Like, sign contracts and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you buy one, Dan, and let us know how it goes? <laughs> <laughs> There'll be two then, though. Someone's already yeah, got one, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Have to buy true. it off the guy that's just backed it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just a little bit confusing because, like you say, I think the one in 2017 was just for the arcade machine yeah one of the arcade machines but now there's three of them so you know you know what else is funny that the fact they've got this little 2600 look-alike console yeah uh, the controller that it comes with though looks like a super nintendo controller (laughs) yeah the dog bone (laughs) controller isn't it yeah so i don't know just it just the whole thing's just it also Very seems, I don't know if you've scrolled to the bottom, but there's like a load of rappers with them as well. So like Snoop Dogg's got one, Ludacris has got one, <laughs> Little John. And it's like, maybe these are just rappers that are buying this poly oh, cake. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh yeah, that, that's so weird. <laughs> maybe it's just a rapper's console. <laughs> Jim, we were talking about Soldier Boy and his console. Oh God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ago, and that just flashed into my mind then. Yeah. When you said these rappers at the bottom of guy, I thought he was going to say, oh, Soldier Boy, he's going to be talking <laughs> yeah. in it with his Chinese tech. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, if you have got a load of money, you want to burn on uh, an interesting and very expensive project. There seems to be plenty of people vying for your money right now. I'll put it that way. So uh, Polycade, if you can get your head around it, um, yeah, do let us know. Now, of course, it is Halloween this weekend, and it's something we always do on the show every year. We talk about Halloween games. Now, I did mention that you know, Alone in the Dark is always one of my favourite games to play on Halloween. But I rediscovered something that I'd forgotten about, actually, a, a little demo that came out in 1993 uh, called Jack in the Dark. And it's about a, a girl who goes trick-or-treating. Her name's Grace Saunders, and she goes into a toy story after dark, and all the toys come to life as well. And I remember seeing that on telly and thinking how fun it looked. And I downloaded it recently thinking, right, I'm saving that for Halloween. And I think it also came on the CD versions of Alone in the Dark, Alone in the Dark 2. So um, that's my pick for this Halloween. That's what I'm going to be playing tomorrow night, a really good Halloween-themed video game. As Any usual, choices that you guys are going to be getting on? As usual, Dark Seed is always yeah, the yeah. darkest, scariest game ever. <laughs> like, I, I just, I still get scared thinking about that game. I'm not sure what to play because I know I should play something because if I'm a, such a huge horror film and horror game fan. And I'm like, I've not really done anything this Halloween like any games or anything like that. And I'm looking at this article that we spoke about earlier on and it's, it's video game film, you know, films, horror films, video games that we've forgotten about. And I'm looking at it and there's the X-Files game for PS2, which is essentially a yeah. resident evil clone. And I keep seeing it on eBay for like 10 quid. And I'm like, you know what, if I buy that now, I might get it in the next couple of days and I could play that on Saturday. Night. <laughs> Cause <laughs> I sure love I've resident got that evil. somewhere. I'm sure I picked that up at like, um, Playtime, you know, I got a local game shop that used to be in town years ago. And I think it's in a box never played in my garage at the moment somewhere. I'm <laughs> I need sure to... I picked up there. I didn't know about that. Yeah, it's a Resident Evil clone, which, I, which right. I've known about for years. And it's just one of those ones that I'm like, I need to pick that up. You know, and I'm looking at this article, the other games are like the Saw game, the Predator game, the Jaws game and stuff, which are all kind of cool PS2 games and stuff. But yeah, X-Files, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Actually... that's going to be the one. I was playing Dead Rising the other day and I forgot Ooh. how good that game was. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the the kind of photography stuff that you have to do in the, the middle of like these zombies all getting around you and everything. Really cool title that was, Dead Rising. Yeah, I, I did enjoy the Dead Rising games. I didn't, number three and four were okay, but number one and two, I really, really got Yeah, into number them. one, I was playing that. Yeah, like, wow. really good game, yeah. But yeah, no, definitely, definitely going to play a horror game. Definitely going to sit down, put Indy to bed. 
you know, and just, you know, make my wife go to bed as well and just stay up all night. <laughs> and wake the entire family up by screaming. Yeah, maybe <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, this list on scbr.com, I mean, it's 10 video games based on horror movies that you forgot existed. And you've got the thing in there, uh, which was a PlayStation 2 and Xbox and Windows game from 2002 don't think i've ever played that one but graphically that looks quite yeah cool. i i had that i've oh i have still do have it i got it when i was young on the ps2 interestingly hadn't actually seen the film so it made me go buy the film on dvd well i didn't go buy the film on dvd i got my mate's sister to buy it me because i wasn't 18 what it's was actually, that the blair witch no the thing the thing ah the thing sorry yeah. Um, John carpenter yeah. yeah that's a really 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 good game actually and it's a continuation of the film it's like you're playing a crew like a mop-up crew who come to check out what happened and the thing, you know, the monsters are still there and everything. So one, once again, a bit of a survival horror game, but it's an over-the-shoulder third-person shooter. So it's a good one. Oh, and yeah. then Friday 13th, it came out on the NES. Oh, God. As well. <laughs> that just reminds me of AVGN. <laughs> yeah. The LJN logo on it. You know, yeah. if you watch AG, AVGN, you'll know that's one to be avoided. Um, <laughs> Land of the Dead, Road to Fiddler's Green. This... Um, was that a zombie movie then? Like, yeah, Land of the Dead was the fourth right. George A. Romero zombie film. It came out in like 2004. But right. the game didn't come out in the UK. It only came out in America, North America. It didn't come out anywhere else in the world for the original Xbox, which kind of says says it all really on how good the game was. And was he the guy who did Day of the Dead? <laughs> yeah, he did yes, Night so, of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, yeah. Day of the Dead. Then he did and kind of Dead Rising Dead. was based on that as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, but even yeah. though it says on Dead Rising, it's not based on Dawn of the Dead or affiliated <laughs> with George A. Romero <laughs> in any way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just trading on his good name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number seven on the list, Blair Witch, the video game. I, looking at this here, it's Blair Witch Project came out in 1999. I went to the premiere ago. of Blair wow. Witch Project. Oh, wow. And we had people and they said, right, we've got sick bags underneath every single seat because people have been vomiting in cinemas like throughout the, everywhere that it's been premiered. And it was a proper big deal. And then I saw it and I was like, really <laughs> no. yeah, you know why people puked up it's not because of the action in the movie it's because of the shaky cam yeah oh, yeah. Was it? oh wow <laughs> i was literally about to say it's more just a, like a jump scare kind of film isn't it i was yeah. like why would it make you sick but yeah i didn't think of that yeah, it was well, just mainly game. looking up the notice, wasn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have night vision on. Yeah. Um, video game I've never played. Um, no, or have I. Doesn't look that one. great from what I've seen. Apparently a survival, survival horror game. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre oh, on the Atari 2600. Movie. Such a good movie. <laughs> That's Not another that's game. another AVGM one. Just reminds me of the <laughs> game nerd. Don't think it doesn't look like that. a chainsaw though, does it? In this screenshot, it's, no, it yeah. looks like he's got a deformed arm. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's, yeah, an arm. That's, that's definitely what I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think maybe on the twenty six hundred nineteen eighty three, just a little bit too early for a game uh, that's going to really capture the atmosphere of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, following on from that, you got Halloween, which apparently came from the same publisher. Um, and yeah, it looks just equally as awful. Uh, the Saw video game as well. I didn't play this one either. No, I didn't play this one. I wasn't massively into the films. No. Either, I'm but this is an scared. Xbox. Yeah. Xbox 360 game in 2009. So oh, way too modern. Way too, too modern, modern for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jaws Unleashed, uh, number two on the list as well, where you get to play as Jaws by yeah. the looks of it. Yeah, on PS2. That was it. it was actually a relatively mindless good game, to be honest. <laughs> And then uh, Predator Concrete Jungle. They came out on the PS2 and Xbox as well. I don't, that's not a horror game. Why is that number one? It's not even mm. a horror game. Like, would you even call Predator a horror film? No, no really, an action yeah. movie, isn't it's it? An like, action, yeah. It's a sci fi action movie. Yeah, or isn't thriller, it? Yeah. Or thriller, yeah. When I was a kid, like, every single comic would be Predator versus Predator yeah. versus Predator Eddie versus <laughs> Predator, <laughs> Judge yeah. Dredd versus Predator, Batman. Batman, versus, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Superman at one point. <laughs> I actually mentioned Alien vs. Predator. I think I'd pr rather play that on the Jaguar. Yeah. That is quite a creepy game. Yeah. It's actually quite a spooky game. I'm sure there's uh, like Mr. Blobby vs. Predator somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> if not, Ravi, get it made. Get it made. Get it done. <laughs> so, so if you're going to check out the full list, I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, time to talk to uh, a couple of good friends of this show who have actually started a new podcast that you will enjoy if you like this part of the show where we talk about news. Yeah, we've got Neil from RMC and John Shawler on the line, and they're going to talk about their new podcast, This Week in Retro. How are you doing, guys? Great, Ravi. Thank you. Hi, Ravi. Excellent. Well, it's good to have you on, because I wanted to talk about this podcast. And uh, first, like, how did you guys meet, and um, what what do you actually do? Like, what, what are your channels? 
Well, the first time I came across John was uh, by watching his channel, The Amigos, which is a very Amiga centric and I'm a huge fan of the Commodore Amiga. So uh, I just sort of got to know him without actually get, getting to know him by, by watching his channel. And then at some point, I can't remember exactly where our paths crossed and we got to interact with each other. So a relationship grew from there. How about you, John? Yeah, I, um, you know, I first came across you, Neil, from uh, the list of uh, supporters that I sing at the end of every episode. <laughs> and uh, I, and after singing your name multiple times, I was like, who is this retro man cave guy? And then I then I looked and I it turns out that you were Internet famous, Neil. <laughs> and uh, and and so, um, you know, I wanted to do a show that was different than the types of shows that I'd done before, which was very, you know, re review a game, talk about it. I wanted to do something that was a little bit more news focused and a little bit more wider ranging than just a single game for a single system. So I thought nobody's doing a show, a weekly news show that is only news about the retro scene. A lot of people incorporate a news segment within a larger show. But I thought that there might be an audience for a show that is only news and under a half an hour. So uh, I asked Neil if he was interested. He said, yeah. And that's how This Week in Retro was born. He said, Neil, I want to tap into that sweet audience of yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I was going to say, because we do news on our podcast, but the main thing is kind of the interviews. But you guys have a, a unique aspect, which is it's a transatlantic podcast. You know, we're all based in the UK. But here you've got someone based in the USA and the UK and they're kind of getting differing opinions. And it's very like computer based as well. It's a half an hour long show, isn't it? Yeah, that's the fun thing. I mean, there was not really a plan when we started this out other than let's just see how it goes. Let's talk about the news and see what evolves. And actually what has evolved is that really nice dynamic between John and I, this transatlantic dynamic where we have such different upbringings and memories of the same technology on different sides of the pond that invariably we end up um, with a difference of opinion uh, and we get to discuss and explore those differences. Uh, and it's, it's just really interesting. You know, the news is really the vehicle to get into those discussions and that's where the fun happens. Yeah, that's really the, the springboard to, to say, well, you know, how what what were your memories like whenever we talk about, say, a, a, a new Amiga game or or a new game for the TurboGrafx-16? Uh, for example, here in the United States, the Amiga was, uh, you know, really a non-factor for most people here in, in the States, but it was huge in England. So the way that I approach the Amiga is going to be vastly different than the, the way that Ravi does. Likewise, a, a lot of the uh, console developments, you know, with the NES and things like that, that was a huge part of my life growing up and and maybe not as much for the majority of people in the uk yeah it's it's really interesting having these kind of different opinions and you know um it's like very appealing to retro hour listeners i think because there's a lot of crossover stories there but also uh, we're huge fans of your channels so just having both of you together on a podcast is entertaining anyway yeah, it's great fun. It's great fun. I've got to be honest, it's also a really useful way for me to actually stay up to date with the news <laughs> because, you know, if you're asked to form an opinion on it rather than just skimming through news on social media, then it does get the old brain working. And I like to think that it challenges listeners in the same way. If we ask them to also question the things that we're talking about and consider their differences, then um, I think it, it, it's really healthy to dissect these things. And question things like do we really need another one of those mini retro console re-releases of which we're getting <laughs> hundreds of at the moment you know it's good to think about these things i enjoy it yeah and, well, how and one of the best things about the way that we do the show and i blatantly stole this from another podcast so don't think that, that i came up with this idea <laughs> but i was like how are we going to source these stories because there's so much going on in the world of retro every week you know how are we going to cut this thing down to, to three or four stories to talk about and uh, what we did was we actually set up a subreddit page for this week in retro where listeners can submit stories, they can vote stories up or vote stories down. And we use that as sort of a gauge of how popular these stories are and, and how much people want us to talk about them. And that's that's really been a big help to us in terms of putting the show together. Yeah, there's some really good talking points that come up from the subreddit. And we're now actually starting to throw questions back into the subreddit. As well as them giving us news, we throw back a question that's come up in the podcast and get people to engage. So it's really interesting. And sometimes, I've got to be honest, sometimes the news stories that are submitted they're not the kind of stories that you'd hear on other podcasts it's just whatever's taken that person's fancy um we had an example last week where actually it linked to an article that was quite poorly written 
But even even so, it was a really good basis for a topic of conversation about gaming first. So we always find something to talk about, yeah. Yeah, it's and even, interesting. And even okay. though we do, uh, I would say probably 80% of our stories are gaming related, we do try and touch on important milestones in just retro technology. For example, last week we talked a lot about the, uh, the internet, or I'm sorry, the Ethernet connection mm. has turned 40 years old. I don't know if you were aware, Ravi. Uh, you know, no, I don't I know if the BBC I'm, covered that or not. But, no, uh, I've, I've still got one going up my stairs as well to my <laughs> computer. But it, it, sometimes it's fun to look back on those you know just general technology and talk about our experience with that too i like the idea of it being democratic because um we kind of the way that we choose ours is we have a shared google kind of document and we put in what we find interesting and then like one of us will go that's far too consoley this week that's far too <laughs> amigory this week and our own kind of bias slip into there so it's good because we also get different talking points and uh, i think the two podcast contrast each other really well yeah it is very democratic and and that can actually mean that we're talking about things that we're not entirely comfortable with talking about because we don't have a particular uh, huge amount of experience with that topic but sometimes the most interesting conversations come out of that well how can guys find you then well you can the best place is probably anchor.fm forward slash this week in retro uh, um, from there you'll find links to all of your favorite podcast apps or you can just search for this week in retro in whatever podcatcher uh, app that you use we also uh, put all of our episodes up on youtube and in the youtube description there's also links to each individual podcatcher so no matter where you're listening to your podcast uh, you can find us all right, thank you, Neil and John. And of course, we'll link up their website in our show notes at theretrohour.com if you want more retro in your podcast life throughout the week. Now, before we get into our special guest this week, Dr. Matt Barton talking about RPGs, adventure games, talking to gaming celebrities as well. He's coming up in just a sec. Before we do that, let's give a huge thank you to this week's sponsor. And this is our amazing friends, at Harry's. Now, you know how much we love Harry's. And I can tell that at the moment, Ravi, even though I've not seen you for a few months, you are clean shaven because otherwise, oh, yeah. and normally he is stubble, you know, scraping on the microphone. Yeah, um, actually, I've shaved my beard off and I posted a picture of it on our Twitter, which was really good. Um, I was using Harry's and it really helped because it's like the smoothest shave that I've had. And it really helped afterwards as well because y- you can get a bit itchy or a bit kind of rashy, but. Um, their kind of products really helped me with that. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, look at Ravi, or baby smooth. Because <laughs> a lot of us will, like, lockdown all summer, you might, you know, let your beard go a little bit. You want a bit of a tidy up, especially now coming into Christmas and everything. Well, listen, we want you to give Harry's a try. And obviously, for supporting our sponsors, you're really supporting the podcast as well. So we really appreciate this. And we do find you the best deals. And we go with sponsors that we really believe are fantastic quality products as well. And they've got a great story behind Harry's. It's actually two guys, Jeff and Andy, who were fed up with overpriced razors. And they decided to fix shaving. That was their and they knew the only way they could do that and ensure premium quality was by buying their own factory. And they've been making blades for a 100 years now. And they've actually just released their sharpest ever blades and added in a new lubricating strip, meaning you're going to get an even closer and more comfortable shave. And the best part of it is as well, they haven't actually raised prices. So replacement blades are still as little as £1.95 each. So we want you to give Harry's a go and start your subscription with a trial set. So all you have to do to get the most comfortable shave, the closest shave you've ever had, nip onto this website right now, harrys.com forward slash retro, and claim a trial set for just £3.95. And of course, you'll be helping out the Retro Hour podcast by doing it. So head to this website right now, harrys.com slash retro. Thanks to our good friends at Harry's. Now, let's get into the Hall of Fame this week. These are people who've made this podcast possible. The only reason we can keep bringing out an episode for you every single Friday, dedicating the time during the week to getting guests, getting our equipment, our microphones, our computers, the software that we edit it with, the websites that we host it on. There is a lot of stuff that needs to go into making a podcast like this each week. And really, we couldn't do it without your support. Now, we do have a patron that's running at the moment. We are going to record our uh, next patron's exclusive podcast as well. Um, over the next week, I think we're going to be interviewing Joe on this one. Oh, so if you've ever wondered what goes on behind <laughs> the, you know, the, the scenes of handsome Joe in his rock and roll life, 
<laughs> you're going to get the full story on the uh, the Retro Hour After Hours podcast. I'm sure you've got some stories already in mind to tell, Joe. It's just it's just sausage rolls and peanut butter, really. It's like nothing, yeah, nothing too exciting. I've ever heard one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, of course, you're helping out the podcast by doing this. You're going to get an ad-free episode. Sometimes you get the show early. You get an exclusive patrons-only podcast. We're posting videos there. We do a monthly hangout as well that we are going to be doing this weekend on Sunday evening. So if you want to join us for an hour uh, to have a bit of a chat, we, we couldn't do it last weekend in the end, so we've moved it. So there is still time if you want to join us this Sunday night. The link will be on our Patreon. And of course, you will get a mention in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And let's give a big thank you to our newest patrons. Thank you to Joshua Pike. Jeffrey Gebhardt. Casey McGinty. Count Duckula, Ducky Poos. <laughs> and Nicholas Lindholm who all made donations into our Patreon. And if you'd like to do the same, you can find it right now on our website at theretrohour.com. Right then, next, we're going to be talking adventure games, RPGs, with gaming historian Dr. Matt Barton. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, we can't wait for a great nostalgic conversation with uh, this week's guest who runs a channel called uh, Matt Chat that is actually one of the we, we mentioned this to Matt before we started recording it was actually a big inspiration for us setting up this podcast he does really in-depth interviews with professional video game designers developers people behind companies so if you love what we do on this show you're probably a fan of him already but if not do check him out on YouTube he's called Matt Chat so it is our pleasure to welcome to the Retro Hour podcast Matt Barton hello Matt hi oh, Hi, Dan. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for that. Very, very nice. Thank you. Well, before we get into the kind of things you've been covering on your channel over, you know, many years now that you've been doing it, I mean, it'd be quite interesting to find out a bit about your personal story. I mean, where did your experiences with video games and computers begin? Uh, I guess it must have began at the beginning, you know. I've... <laughs> Sometimes I think I had a USB cable instead of an umbilical cord, you know, attached to my... <laughs> You know, we were playing games with both my parents. We would play games on the uh, Commodore VIC-20, I think was our first computer. And then from there, the Commodore 64, and then the Amiga 1000. Nice. <laughs> of course, the arcades, you know, pretty much a gamer family, I guess. And I used to, you know, being a kid, you just think, well, everybody's family must be like this, you know? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, really, really fun childhood memories. Lots of games, lots of computers. Were there any arcade games that you made a beeline for that you know you always run straight to in the arcade? Well, the early ones I remember, my dad would actually uh, designate designate me as the fire button boy. <laughs> so we'd be playing uh, what was it, uh, Sinistar, I think, and he would fly the ship around, and I, my job was just to hit the uh, the fire button as fast as I could. Yeah, so that's my Probably my first memory of that. Uh, but yeah, I love the uh, Bubble Bobbles, one of my favorites. I like uh, Robotron. You know, one that I like a lot is Green Beret. You know, that one to me is just, there's just something about that one that always captures my attention. There's very few that I just won't play. <laughs> if I'm lucky enough to come across one, I'll pop in a quarter. Well, many of our guests on the podcast have mentioned like how influential D and D was. Uh, were you much of a D and D player? And um, how important were these titles to like gaming culture before computers were really massively popular? Oh, absolutely uh, huge! You know, I, I think especially on the computer game side, uh, they really played a, a big role. You know, no matter how far back you want to go. I mean, what was it? Maybe in the that that adventure game, Colossal Cave Adventure. Yeah. Sometime in the I guess that was the early seventies, maybe. I don't have my notes in front of me, but <laughs> you know, obviously those guys were big into it. You know, in a lot of those games, the idea was to see if we can take some of the fun of the tabletop Dungeons and Dragons game and turn it into a computer game. Uh my story's a little bit interesting because I was, you know, I grew up way out in the country, <laughs> the deep south of the United States. Uh, Louisiana. So there really wasn't anybody around there uh, that I could have played with, you know, even if I'd wanted to. So I got a, my exposure to D&D came through uh, the different computer games based on it. Uh, so I got into D&D through that uh, instead of the other way around. But yeah, I, I think of uh, all the people I've interviewed on Matt Chat, I'm, I'm pretty sure 99% of them played Dungeons and Dragons at some point, uh, if not extensively. 
you know, so it made a huge impact. And what, what like kind of texts or novels do you think have massively influenced the way that games were made or, or designed back in those early days? Uh, well, certainly Tolkien uh, comes to mind, but some of the other ones, uh, let's see, Michael Moorcock, his works come up more than you would think. The, uh, oh, who's the, uh, oh, Jack Vance is his name. Whew. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his name comes up a lot. Uh, Doc Smith. You know, so basically a lot of the, I guess if you could, uh, putting Tolkien aside, you know, a lot of the, pretty much any of the pulpy uh, 50s and 60s sci-fi and fantasy type authors played a big role. Uh, those are the ones that certainly come to, to my mind. Were you kind of playing any BBSs or any any MUDs or those early kind of multi-user dungeons? Oh, yeah. Yeah, those were, those were my crack cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved MUDs, man. The first time I saw one of those, I didn't get to play that until I was in college. And I didn't, I didn't even know anything that amazing existed at that point. But I was at a computer lab. And this was really before the, or at least before the uh, World Wide Web had come there. People that were online were using Telnet and Pine and things of that, Unix, I guess. And there was this guy sitting next to me playing that. And I, I kept looking over there and I'd see like Dragon on the screen and like the dice rolling and things, <laughs> you know, I was I've always been a shy, a shy guy. So it took a lot uh, for me to get up enough nerve to go over there and like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you playing? And he's like, it's a mud man. And I just sat there. I would not leave until he explained like what it was and how do I create a character on that? And man, I don't think I left that. I had to, they had to uh, kick me out of the lab that night so they could close. I mean, that was one of the most amazing games I've played. I think, I don't know what your other question was, but yeah, MUDs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, BBSs. Uh, yeah, I played those. <clears throat> uh, I played around with those a little bit. Again, uh, being way out in the middle of nowhere, pretty much any BBS was a long distance call uh, and I didn't have any money. Uh, so that really wasn't an option. There were a few on 1-800 numbers you could call. I did that a little bit. I did I did get to play some of Seth Robinson's games, uh, Legend of the Red Dragon. So it's probably my favorite. One of your kind of early videos was when you were talking with Richard Bartle. And I absolutely love that because he invented the class system. And that's very much in gaming now. And it's a kind of standard that's been set there. Um did you notice that there was a lot of kind of early standards that were being set that you can now even see today in like multiplayer or RPG titles? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think that a lot of the groundwork for even something like World of Warcraft, you know, it's pretty clear. You can see the the mud origins of that. Um, and I think Bartle in particular, you know, he was more, or I guess he still is. He's he's good at making the games, but but he's also good at thinking about them theoretically and talking about them uh, intellectually, you know, if you will. You know, so you can really get immersed not just in the the games he made, but the, all the writings that he's done uh, on the topic. I mean, he's a. I was really so honored to get to interview him. Well, we mentioned at the start about your YouTube channel. I mean, one thing I, I didn't mention that I should have is that you're also an author as well. Um, and a book that you did, Dungeons and Desktops, The History of Computer Role-Playing Games, was released in 2008. Why did you think that book was needed then, and what, what made you want to write that? Uh, that book started as a, uh, a blog post. You know, back in, I don't even know if anybody was using the term blog back then. Uh, but I just wrote up a little, we had an ma online magazine, we called it, called Armchair Arcade. You know, we just come up with different, we thought about it kind of like a magazine, something like Amigo World, I guess. And so we'd have all these different topics. And I did one one time just sort of casually on the history of uh, computer role-playing games. And for whatever reason, that article just took off. I mean, the, the, the feedback, the comments, it was you know obvious that there was something there you know, worth uh, following up on. And I want to say it was Game Set Watch, another blog the, from the Gama Sutra uh, brand. Uh, but they contacted me. They wanted to put the, they wanted to take my blog post and put it on their blog and pay me for it. And then have me do a couple of follow-ups to it. And I was just, I think I was probably in my early 20s at this point. 
And I, I wanted to say that might have been the first time I ever got paid to write something. <laughs> so that was fun. You know, back then there was this big spurt of uh, interest in reading about video games. So there was a book publisher that had come to them and uh, asked them if they had ideas for books. Or, you know, there were authors uh, on the blog that might be interested in writing a book. Uh, so that's, they basically came to me. Uh, for dungeons and desktops, rather than the other way around, but you know, that's the ideal arrangement, really. If you can, if you can get it, and I think you're right as well, because it did kind of seem around that time that that was kind of when interest in you know retro games, if you like, kind of began. I guess it's because oh. it got to that stage where there's actually enough history there for people to kind of retrospectively look back on it. I guess. Yeah, it kind of fizzled out sadly, but I remember there for a while I thought I was just going to be a superstar because you know I did the. <laughs> It started with the blog, uh, then it's a book, you know, and then believe it or not, there was a guy calling, uh, uh, calling us about, hey, let's turn it into a, a movie. You know, let's do this feature wow. film thing. That's, that's what became that gameplay, a gameplay documentary. Uh, but, you know, sadly, it, it kind of, like I say, sort of fizzled out there eventually. Maybe it's ready for its second uh, comeback, though. Uh, that'd be nice to see. So when you started the YouTube channel, was this like a direct reaction to the uh, kind of people that were looking at your book and also kind of a bit of an experiment? <laughs> yeah, that was definitely an experiment. I'm the kind of guy, I get bored doing any one thing after a while, you know, so I like to branch out and try to do stuff. And I, you know, I kind of felt like I'd done the, the blogging thing for long enough. You know, I wanted to see if I could tap into this uh, YouTube phenomenon. And of course, back then it was mostly cat videos and dogs on skateboards. You had about <laughs> 10 minutes to work with. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to see if I could do something with the book. And, and one of the things that bothered me about writing Dungeons and Desktops was that it was a lot of the times it's hard to describe in print form. Even if you have screenshots, it's sort of hard to describe what's happening in some of these games. You know, it's a lot easier if you can show it. Uh, so I was excited about that concept. And uh, plus, I, I really like interviewing people, you know, as, as you guys seem to. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun just to have a chat. And I think yeah. as well, when you're interviewing people that kind of made the games that you grew up playing and actually hearing it, you know, from the horse's mouth, as it were, there's just, it's kind of oh, like, man. you know, if, if you told yourself you'd have been doing that 25 years ago, you'd have been like, what? No way. Will I be talking to Richard Bartle or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah. It makes you feel pretty cool. And a lot of these games, my dad, you know, like I say, my, my whole family is interested in these games. You know, and I get to tell them, yeah, I, well, I talked to the person that made this. <laughs> I've talked to Becky Berger, you know. Well, I have to, I've talked to Lord British. You know, you really feel good about that. Well, you know, when you originally approached, like, these famous developers and people that made these games, I mean, what, what kind of made you decide that you were going to do that? And did you think at first that they were going to be up for it? Or or you're a bit like us and thinking, oh, they'll never talk to us. And then you get a pleasant surprise when you get, like, a, a tweet back or an email or something. Yeah, for me, the hard part was always just finding them. A lot of the people I was interested in talking to, they had been out of the game industry sometimes for 10, 20 years, even at that point. And so it was tricky to find them. Uh, but even some of the bigger names, you know, I've had some pretty big, big names on the show. But, you know, back when I was doing it, they the, usually the first thing they would tell me is you're the you're the first time I've ever been interviewed. You know, I had several people tell me that or, uh, you're the at least the first time it's been on video or live. You know, I guess back in the magazine days, they might uh, just write back and forth or answer some questions maybe over the, over the phone, I'm guessing. Uh, but it was new to them. A lot of them had not really been interviewed in that format before. And so, you know, it was kind of weird for me because I'm kind of like uh, almost doing the whole Wayne's world. Uh, I'm not worthy. <laughs> 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 yeah, but they're looking at it like, uh, you know, this is my chance to be on YouTube. You know, it was really kind of bizarre there for a while. Well, any people kind of like, why do you want to talk about old games or why do you want to talk about oh, yeah. old they stuff that I've done? They totally don't get it, you know, because a lot of these, uh, you know, it's not like they're always on the internet searching for their own games and seeing what, what people are talking about. You know, a lot of these folks are like, uh, I had no idea people were still interested in this. You know, I got that reaction more times than you would think. And I think it really, I mean, it was a big deal when the games were new, but, you know, here we are 10, 20 years later. And when they hear that there's somebody that's still interested in their work, I think they're, <laughs> I mean, they're really eager to talk to you. They, they, they love it. 
Uh, you know, a lot of people will ask me to interview somebody who's just come out with a game. Uh, you know, this is a big deal. And those are usually the hardest people for me because there's, you know, they're sort of, their hands are tied in so many ways. You know, they can't talk about this. They can't talk about that. Uh, they might have a, a handler, you know, there. <laughs> uh, I just, I don't really like doing those kind of interviews, to be honest. You know, I'd much rather just be talking to someone who, you know, it doesn't matter to me if they haven't made a game in 10 years. Which titles really kind of captured your imagination then as a as a child or growing up and whether they be role play or not? Some of the ones I remember, I was thinking about one just the other day that I haven't really heard many people talk about. It was called Mindwalker. Oh, yeah. I, uh, an Amiga that? title as yeah, well. Yeah, an that Amiga was. title. Yeah. There was one called uh, Alien Fires. Yeah, you know, this is these really weird sort of games. And I remember playing those as a kid and just thinking, man, I wonder what kind of person made this. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, they must be really far out. Uh, but yeah, just the games I was uh, spending most of my time with would be something like uh, Bard's Tale, one of my favorites. Uh, Pool of Radiance was really the first one that I ever cared enough about to, to sit down and actually figure out how to play it well enough to beat it. You can tell that you're a fan of Bard's Tale because there's so many videos on it on your channel as well. Yeah, I had my wife make me a Bard's Tale hat. If you watch the Bard's Tale video, I actually have a sequence at the end where I play the uh, uh, the song from the first game, and I'm kind of in my Bard's Tale costume. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I don't know. That's a, I do some nerdy stuff sometimes, guys. You know. Oh, we love that. The nerdier, the better for our show. Uh, it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned before about MUDs. I mean, do you think when, you know, multiplayer elements came in and different users, did that kind of drastically change the gameplay experience for, you know, RPGs, for example? Yeah, I think uh, you know, that, that's an interesting question because I don't know about you, what, what you, uh, you know, what your experience was like. Uh, for me, the, when I was playing those MUDs, it just seemed like I was meeting just really fascinating people on a daily basis. You know, I was, I was making friends on there and, you know, pretty soon, you know, I think Bartle talks about that. I forget what he calls it, but the, the process by which you go from being caring about your character and leveling and grinding up your uh, levels and stuff to just wanting, wanting to log in to socialize, you know, the people that you met. And I think that dimension somehow got lost. You know, when I play World of Warcraft, I, I hardly ever meet anybody on there. You know, you think there would be uh, a lot more people to, to chat with on there, uh, but something it's just not—it's just never been the same, really, for me. Uh, I don't know if the sometimes I wonder if maybe the muds, the barrier to entry was high enough that you only got people <laughs> that were sort of nerdy, and so you'd have some stuff in common with them to talk about, sort of baked in. Well, the more modern games, you really don't need any any special training or anything to create a character in an account but i think you make a good point there because i mean you know i remember when i first got on the internet in the mid 90s and you'd spend all day on irc or chat rooms yeah. were massive back then but now i think people maybe just take it for granted that you can just talk to anyone around the world at any time i think back then it was a bit more special it seemed yeah i kind of compare it I've, I've talked to people i've never done it myself but you know but one of my dance hobbies was the, the ham radio and I remember it, it sounded like sort of similar to that you know so you you took so much training to be to even know what a ham radio is, much less be on it and <laughs> you know, chatting with people from around the, the world. But you know, you sort of got this built-in uh, shared kind or uh, sort of built-in common ground, right? Just the fact that you're on the ham radio and that you are part of that scene, I guess. Uh, so that dimension seems to have gone away or at least diminished somewhat. How did you feel about the kind of adventure games that all turned into FMV games? And uh, it was a bit like the period before adventure just really disappeared and became a, a bit of a niche. Yeah, that's, that's always been sad to me. You know, we were talking before about Monkey Island. <laughs> Still, you know, somebody dumped their Amiga out on the side of the road and, ah, yeah, I, I was, uh, just to update the listeners, I was telling Matt about uh, me walking a dog and then uh, kind of seeing an Amiga on the side of the road with Monkey Island and everything there. Oh, wow. And I was just like, right, score. But, oh, you know, man, someone was chucking that out at the death of adventure games or kind of point and clicks. Yeah, but I mean, those games are beautiful games. 
and even before that, even if you want to go back to the Infocom yeah. days and Zork and uh, Planetfall, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. I mean, you guys know these games. Right? I got so frustrated <laughs> at Hitchhiker's Guide. Oh. <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide is awesome. Yeah, I love it. Uh, but it's the most unfair video game I think I ever played. <laughs> well, those games were, you know, some people don't realize this now, but those were like the biggest hit, you know, best-selling games of the, of the time. Yeah. You know, these things were huge. This was like the AAA, you know, experience, and it was all text. But, you know, I, I still like to play adventure games. I, I don't know where people get off on this this idea. Adventure games are dead. You know, the adventure games, uh, they're too boring. There's actually one out. I just played one called Beautiful Desolation. You know, I would consider that an adventure game. And I think there's something beautiful about text adventures as well. I like kind of going back to, you know, the earliest kind of form oh, of adventure yeah. games. The fact that it's it, it's got kind of equated to like, you know, compared to reading a book and watching a, a movie, it's, it gets your Im- imagination really going, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And you know, I've had Scott Adams on. I've talked to the Zork folks uh, over email. I'd love to get them on, on the show one day. Yeah, I remember Infocom. There's one of their famous advertisements was a picture of a brain and the caption was something like the greatest graphics technology ever invented. <laughs> that is, it's just kind of makes my, uh, my skin tingle to think, to even thinking about that ad. I mean, that, that's kind of a, a, a wonderful way to put something like that, but yeah, it's so easy to get. I think, you know, here's the thing. I think when you're trying to market games, it's a lot easier if you can show people this awesome cinematic you know, or back back then, you know, the, the graphical adventure games or the graphical games, you know, you could put those screenshots on the box and that becomes a selling point. And people can look at it, see what's going on in the screenshot and get a picture of what playing that game is like. Uh, the text adventure game, though, you know, it's a little bit trickier to, to communicate the fun of that just by looking at screenshots. So I think that was part of their problem. We're going to go into our line again, and I was just thinking, like, you know, these mods and the rules and restrictions. Um, do, you, do you think they're needed in modern modern MMOs with the kind of sandbox feeling and, uh, you know, people going and creating their own adventures uh, rather than sticking to a set line or a set quest? I mean, sort of more of an open world? Type? Yeah, so, like, you know, these kind of... Z- zombie games at the moment or, or there's there's lots of kind of just sandbox games gta online you'd kind of just do your own thing do you think there's there's room for that as well as the kind of rules and restricted ones yeah i, I hope so i mean that's what i have always preferred you know i get that i guess people feel like they don't have enough time to invest in something that's you know too massive i don't know what the deal is but certainly something like what is it elite dangerous and I don't know what the, the status of Star Citizen, you know, if that ever takes off <laughs> or uh, EVE Online, I guess. You know, there are some out there that seem yeah, to me to kind of capture that. Oh, go ahead. Well, one of the interviews that I absolutely love that you did was about Richard Garriott and how he'd tried to implement rules and restrictions into the original Ultima and it went massively <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's fun to talk to him. And a lot of his side hobbies that he has, like collecting those uh, automatons, automata, little wind-up toys, basically, and, and like his Halloween parties that he would throw, and this, this house that he built. You know, it sounds like it's not unrelated stuff, but really, I think it's part of his personality uh, that gets somehow or another inputted into his games. You know, that sort of love of just tinkering around with things and building stuff and you know winding it up and seeing what it will do but yeah so what did I, he might have to remind me what so what did he say about the rules and restrictions there i there was a thing where he was trying to introduce animals into ultima and they all ended up getting killed and then he tried to enforce some kind of laws and then somebody <laughs> came and killed him his his uh, character in game oh you're yeah, talking about ultima big... online oh yeah yeah <laughs> It's a big assassination attempt. Oh my god! You got to go back and see if you can find the original Ultima Online manual, you know, and read that because they're giving you this advice about how you're supposed to behave as a player. <laughs> it's, it's like I don't, I don't think that lasted for two minutes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to be like, hail, uh, you know, warrior, hail, sir, whatever. <laughs> you know, like that sort of quasi medieval uh, dialect and. 
all this stuff. And I'm pretty sure that the the game hadn't been online for two minutes before there was all kinds of miscreants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people just want to have a little, they want to see what they can get away with, right? And, always uh, pushing the boundaries. <laughs> yeah, always pushing. I mean, how many people are talking about, ult- you know, they played the original Ultima games. I mean, come on, you hit list, you, you saw the, the game code, you made some changes just to uh, see what you could get away with, right? Well, you're an English professor as well. I mean, do you ever use gaming or RPGs in your classes? Oh, sure. And we're actually trying to get some uh, game courses here off the ground, just uh, first and foremost about games. I think it's still useful. This is actually one of my my themes is that you still do need to know how to program and understand like, uh, you know, C sharp or whatever. Uh, But it's increasingly to the point where, you know, you could make a game if all you have is, quote unquote, all you have is good writing skills, you know, that those skills alone are enough to help you pretty much make a solid game. You know, the rest is, there's so many assets you can download. You know, if you're not, if you're not good as an artist or not good with music, you know, there's, there's all those assets are available. Uh, but the part where the creativity is still needed, you know, a lot of that can come just from uh, having a good imagination and being able to, to write it out. How do you feel about like, user created content and and modifying games as well uh kind of changing them from their original purpose by the community or the players i think it's fabulous that's one of the reasons i like computer games still do i, I kind of prefer computer the pc platform if you will over the consoles because i always felt like the computer side did that better you know there's always this idea that you're buying this not just to uh even like the commodore 64 of course, the Apple II, you know, those those computers, it wasn't just for playing games. You know, the idea was you could make some of your own games. And I think that's how a lot of people get started with that was they didn't want to just make their own game from scratch. Uh, their first exposure might have been looking at the source code of a game they owned, especially if it was written in basic. And then they could change some stuff around and see how that uh, changed the gameplay. They probably, let's be honest, you probably just wanted to give yourself uh, unlimited hit points, <laughs> <laughs> unlimited lives or something. Uh, but you sort of got aware of, hey, there's all this code running underneath this game. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, popping the hood of your car and just like looking at, oh, there's this, all this stuff going on, you know, you're getting really like, like curious about how it all works. I yeah, think but, you're right, because I think a lot, a lot of kids' kind of first programming experience was like, you know, poking and peeking on the Commodore 64 to get unlimited lives. Yeah, and the same thing with these mod engines and things. Like, you know, I kind of want to just do this goofy thing where I'll just take this game and maybe I'll put my friends into it. <laughs> you know, this annoying kid at school, let's just make him the enemy and create a little level <laughs> around. You know, just kind of goofy, you know what kids are like, you know. Uh, but just in the process of that, they're also learning about these components. and You know, heck, that's... Uh, those are pretty valuable insights. Well, obviously, it's kind of technical achievements increase and capability of computers and consoles. Do you feel now it's kind of a fine balance between gameplay and graphics in modern games? You know, I could say that, and I agree with that. But, I mean, you can go back to the ColecoVision days and see that. <laughs> yeah. Look at the graphics on the – what was it, the Intellivision? You know, the, the sports games on the Intellivision are just like you're in the uh, – <laughs> Just like you're on the field, you know. Hey, no, it's not. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying, though. I, I think that is, you know, sadly, I was making a joke the other day that, you know, the new consoles, the next generation of consoles are coming out. My God, and they're going to have, I don't know, four trillion colors and this and that. And, you know, and then and what game are the kids playing? Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't. You know, I don't, I never have thought that, you know, just having a better graphics makes it a better game uh, per se. I mean, there's so many other important things. It always seems to be the thing to sell consoles on though, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but you know, it's just something you can easily show people. You, know, you have a television commercial and you're like, wow, look at that. It looks, looks more realistic than looking out the window. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so that, that's kind of exciting. You know, a good example of that nowadays, I think, was with the the VR, hmm. the, the, all these head, VR headsets and things. I mean, it's really exciting technology, and it really gets you, your juices flowing as a nerd, you know, something like that. Uh, but I don't think they've quite figured out how to make that, you know, real killer app for it yet. You know, something that's just so fun uh, that people that 
don't really care. So the people that aren't impressed with the technology would still want to play it just because it's fun. Yeah, or experiences that you want to return to over and over again. I mean, I've yes. got a couple of VR headsets, and after you've done the, you know, kind of watching a movie in IMAX style on it or playing a couple of the games, it's just, I've got a couple that I've put on the shelf and just haven't used for months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, they need their version of Tetris is yeah. what they need. Just something that's just, even if I don't give a damn about VR, man, I've got to play that game. You know, I'll get the VR just to be able to play it. Testament to these kind of old games, a lot of them are being redone and you're getting these old worlds being revisited with like reduxed versions with better graphics. Um, which titles would you like to see kind of redone and uh, a redux of? Oh, good question. Huh? Well, I would say Pool of Radiance, but that's sort of been done already. There's that gold box uh, engine companion uh, sort of wraparound uh, for it. Uh, that would certainly be something. I'm trying to think maybe a little bit uh, older. Hmm. You know, the Ultima games have already gotten a, a remake, at least the first few. You know, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. I'm trying to think of like a RPG that's a lot of fun, but just has a really cumbersome interface. Yeah, because I think that's probably where the, what would make the big difference. Not so much just it looks better, but if they can, you know, especially those older games where you had to basically memorize all these keys on your keyboard, like K for kill, L for this, T for that. You know, some of those games, if you bit, if you overhauled the interface, uh, you could make something a lot more playable. It does kind of feel like that's one area that we've massively improved upon in you know the last 20 years even, just you know user interfaces and knowing how users are going to interact with a game compared to back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, something like Ultima Underworld even. You know, that's, that's a little bit hard to get around, you know, if you're used to modern games. And, I, you know, that's, I don't think that would be too hard to, uh, you know, to go back in there and redo that. It is, you do have to walk a fine line between uh, appealing to the people that played the original game and making it feel faithful i guess to them yeah uh, but at the same time you know the whole point is to wow people and appeal to the people that never played that game before now, that's a delicate balancing act I, you know i often feel like you'd be better off just making something new uh, than going back but you know, I, I could be dissuaded <laughs> <laughs> especially these games that have been around for so long and there were a lot of them were an inherent part of our childhood and then seeing them kind of get messed with if it's not done in the right way it can be you know quite an emotional thing sometimes if they do it wrong well even like uh, like the Baldur's Gate 3 uh, mm. situation that's gotten people so riled up about or uh, you know I think that in Exile did a, somehow or another with the new Wasteland games they seem to have been able to strike that chord. You know, at least I haven't found too many people that were just hating those games because they uh, didn't feel enough like the original Wasteland. Uh, you know, you could see a difference between people talking about Wasteland 2 and Wasteland 3 versus the people. They have a different opinion of uh, the new Bard's Tale. You know, if you remember that earlier Bard's Tale, the PlayStation one, that's where you go wrong, I guess. Even though I, I liked the, both those games okay, you know, something about it just didn't quite work. You know, the graphics are better, sure. Uh, but is it a better game? Uh... <laughs> Have you kind of noticed that there's been a, a resurgence of adventure titles and also point-and-click titles recently? Well, that's something I try to promote as much as I can. Uh, uh, Julia, oh, what's her last name? I just interviewed her. Uh, but she's doing one called The Crimson Diamond. Which one was that? Sorry, Crimson uh, Diamond. The Crimson Diamond. Yeah, Crimson Diamond store. Julia yeah. Minamata. Yeah. Yeah, she's fantastic. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, if you want something that captures that retro vibe. Uh, but of course, there's other ways to do that too. Really, the uh, that beautiful desolation game. Uh, to me, that's one of the most uh, artistic looking games I've ever seen. I wish there would be. More, I wish there would be more games that were like Mist and Riven because that's the. You know, you're talking about FMV before. Uh, I think that got a bad a bad rep. I was going to say, actually, you were talking about visiting old titles, and I played Mist the other day, and uh, the spinning around on the camera made me feel so sick <laughs> when you move left to right. Oh yeah, yeah. it's just it was just like rendered images, wasn't it? But I remember seeing those in like magazines and just thinking, video games can't look that good. Well, that's the the thing about Mist and Riven that I think that really stands out to me again was just normal people buying that 
And one of the reasons they would buy it is they, they would say, this is a, an IQ test. You know, playing Mist and Revan makes you smarter. You know, there was that kind of belief, like you had to be basically a genius. <laughs> it's like a Mensa <laughs> test or something, you know, being able to play that. And, you know, that to me was, a, I actually thought that was appealing. Like it's not a game that dumbs you down or anything. It's, it's like the opposite of that, right? Which yeah, I think is great. I, I feel that way about all adventure games. You, know, you, you feel like, oh, I saw that puzzle. <laughs> Look at me go, you know. And I guess with Mist, you know, we just got like CD-ROM drives and our 486s. We wanted something to play on them. Well, I've heard that people would uh, see Mist on display somewhere and just be so amazed by it, they would actually get the upgrade their PCs just to yeah. play it. You remember a lot of people back then were rocking like the Hercules CGA or... No, that was a, not even CGA. It was like the monochrome. Yeah, I think those games definitely did a lot to kind of push <laughs> technology forward, didn't it, and make us spend more money. <laughs> well, especially on those PCs. Remember the... You know, this was, I guess that was pre-Windows. When was that? 90? Mist was like 92, I think. 93, I think it might have been, yeah. So it was pre, pre-Windows 95. Yeah, Early like days, yeah. Yeah. I don't think everybody had the, unless you had the Amiga <laughs> <laughs> or the Atari ST. Well, he also wrote an insider's look at the history of Grand Theft Auto as well and Super Mario and other influential games as well. Oh, sure. Because um, that's different to all the RPG and adventure stuff we've been talking about. You know, these are kind of pure arcade games. So why did you write that one then? Tell us a bit more about that. Uh, well, I've always been just interested in the, I guess, the industry as a whole. Uh, I wish that I knew more about uh, the Japanese language and culture because I feel like there's a whole... And I've read some books on it. You know, this seems like there's new ones coming out. But, you know, I feel like that's a very influential part of the story is uh, what was happening in Japan, you know, all throughout the, I guess, throughout the 80s and 90s on up till today. You know, to be honest with you, <laughs> a lot of that has to do with when I talk to somebody and I say, oh, I write books about video games. And usually their first question would be about, oh, like Mario or Pac-Man or maybe uh, Donkey Kong. You know, so I felt like I needed to, I wanted to talk to them too. And a lot of those folks wouldn't be as interested in, say, Pool of Radiance or Bard's Tale. They don't even know what that is. Uh, but if you're talking about, say, Final Fantasy, or I guess, what else is in this book? <laughs> Space Invaders. <laughs> uh, that, you know, that's their, that was their entrance into video games, right? Something like Grand Theft Auto. And, and that, you know, I think it makes them happy uh, to read about the the history of that and, you know, think about it. Not just as just something that was fun, but you know, sort of start thinking about the design of it, maybe even the philosophy behind it. Well, out of all of the interviewees on your channel, uh, which one would you say is the best for someone checking it out for the first time? And which one was your favorite? Oh, favorite. The one that, I'll tell you this. The one that most people start with is John Romero. You know, that's the one that people watch first and seem to associate me with. <laughs> uh, more than the other ones, but certainly a lot of those early ones. Now, I always thought that the ones, the one I did with uh, uh, Becky Berger Heinemann was really good. But probably one of my favorites that doesn't get talked about a lot. The reason I like it is because he was my influencer, my inspiration really for doing the you know, what I do was Stuart Chaffee. But he had a show on public broadcasting here uh, that I watched as a kid called Computer Chronicles. Yeah. And you know, he was talking back when it wasn't retro, you know, it's it like the, the brand new Amiga 500, you know. And so I just watched that and just be hanging on the guy's every word, just thinking this this is the coolest person I've ever seen. <laughs> and so I love it. It was really fun getting to interview him. Uh, I really had that kind of surreal experience because he was somebody, you know, a lot of these developers and really John Romero too, you know, I played their games, but, I, you know, I hadn't really seen them you know, before. Uh, so that was a new experience. Whereas with the, with Stuart, you know, I'd seen him on TV many, many, many times. Uh, so that was kind of a, an interesting feeling uh, interviewing the person that I had seen and, and heard from so much. And he charted the entire rise of the personal computer revolution, didn't he? Because that show was like early 80s it started. Oh, yeah. He's, I'm really glad they're, they're archiving all that. And, you know, when I talked to him, he was saying that, uh, it's been a while, but it seemed like I remember him saying that he was a little concerned about some of those archives. You know, he wanted to make sure that was <laughs> available somewhere. I mean, he he recognizes the historical uh, nature of all that. I think he, I think even back then, I think he was aware uh, that this was important stuff that he was 
documenting and uh, the people he was interviewing. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, just, just a profit thing or just gadgets. You know, this is, this is going to have a big impact on our society. And they're great. Watch those old episodes. I think I've probably watched every single episode of Computer Chronicles on ah, YouTube or archive.org. So it's just great good. watching them. <laughs> yeah, it's just so good. And I like this, you know, to me, just the way he approached the topic, he was, you know, always serious, but at the same time, he's being serious. You can tell just, just looking at the guy, let's look at his eyes, you know, he's just loving yeah. it. <laughs> you know, he loves that stuff and it's really uh, addictive to me, you know, watching those, those episodes. And, you know, I don't think, I, t- t- I don't know too many people that have really done it better than him. You know, it's so many times uh people don't really they have this sort of weird thing like it's video games right so you have to be wacky (laughs) Hmm. or you have to drop the f-bomb every other word you know Uh, something like that whereas you know i think he's a lot more respectful of it i guess you know it wasn't like computer chronicles was was all video games but uh you know i I think yeah they covered everything didn't it yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) i'm not as interested when they talk about like the latest database or word processing (laughs) Yeah, like I said, I've tried to watch every episode. There are a few that, that I watch. I'm like, do I really need to learn how to do spreadsheets on an IBM XT? Probably not. <laughs> well, there's probably somebody, I bet you some of your uh, listeners are like, oh, I love those. Those are my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, nobody talks well, about my- Infocom's Cornerstone software. You know, this, I bet there's an episode yeah. dedicated to that somewhere. <laughs> well, it's a great archive. I mean, everyone that you know, finds our chat interesting should go check it out on YouTube or archive.org. And it's great that you get these guys on your show, Matt. Um, what's kind of next for your channel? And have you got an, anyone coming up that we should look out for? Uh, well, I'm going to have Chris Bischoff on next. Uh, he'll be talking about his uh, that art direction that he took on his uh, Beautiful Desolation game. Uh, other people, you know, I always have people in the, you know, that I'm trying to get on, thinking about maybe returning guests. But I usually don't think too far ahead with the show. Kind of more of a seat of my pants kind of guy. <laughs> And we have that in common then. <laughs> well, yeah, we were talking about Ken Williams before, and you, you know, you said he's got a book coming out. So I'm, I'm thinking yeah. I might try to see if I could chat him up. Oh, I think you should do it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah he's, he would, he's such an interesting guy. We could have spent hours talking to him. Yeah, I want to hear hear your your chat too. <laughs> yeah, check it out. <laughs> well, we thoroughly recommend your channel to all our listeners, and you know, there's a lot of crossover with guests, but you've got video as well, so there's the <laughs> extra aspect, and a lot of the interviews are two parters as well, so they're they're quite big. Well, now we can have, I guess, as many hours as we want. We just go to the point of mm-hmm. exhaustion. <laughs> a lot better than that ten minute little ten minute clip. You know, I, I, that's something I've I've really been intrigued. By because you know, I like as a professor, you know, I'm kind of interested in the media studies side of all this. Like, I would have assumed that people wouldn't be interested, you know, in watching like a six hour long gameplay video, like, they would watch about 10 minutes of it and say, Okay, that's enough, (laughs) move on to the next thing. Uh, people's attention spans aren't that you know, this has been the argument for so long is that attention spans are getting narrower and narrower and short, but I actually see the opposite happening. It's like the YouTube videos are getting longer and longer and podcasts are getting, I mean, there's like six, seven hour long podcasts out there. Mm-hmm. You know, like Dan Carlin stuff, you know, <laughs> like eight hour long podcast and people are thrilled about it. Yeah, I think you know, there's room for all that context. I love putting your videos on when I've got something to do and I can leave it playing and, you know, it, just have it on while I'm working or something. Because you, you don't want to click a 10 minute video every 10 minutes. You know, it's, I think that long form content definitely does have a place. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. You know, some people tell me they just they just turn it on when they're mm. having a hard time falling asleep and you know, it plays and <laughs> the soothing <laughs> sound of your voice, you know. I, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> is that a, <laughs> Look, is that a compliment or an insult? I, I don't know. <laughs> well, Matt, your videos are, you know, they're so interesting and everyone should check it out. We'll put a link in our show notes there. Uh, Matt Chat yeah, on really YouTube. Yeah, I really appreciate it's- that. And I'm happy to reciprocate. Fantastic. Fantastic.